Hello, everyone. I have an important announcement to make. So we just got some news from the program team that uh, today's food was supposed, lunch food was supposed to be gluten free, but uh, due to some goof up from the food vendor, uh, catering is catering vendor, the it was not actually gluten free. So in case if any of an, any of you are feeling some issues or uh, and feeling uneasy, there is a nursing staff near the registration counter. So you can reach out there and you can also contact any staff or volunteer or organizer for the directions. Uh, we are really sorry for this inconvenience, but it was unfortunate from our side also. So we are so sorry about that. So now let's begin the next session. So before that, we have done a small raise your hand exercise in the previous session. So let's do that again. How many of you are here developers? Good number. And designers and marketers. So we have a mix of audience. And how many of you have ever browsed a web browsed a website or used an app that was so difficult to scroll or navigate and you f you just came out of that. Yeah, this happened with all of us. And I'm sure you will never want to have the same experience for the website that you build and manage. Am I right? Yeah, so in this talk, we will learn about why it's important to design a digital experience with a purpose. Because without a purpose, nothing is good. We will learn how to apply key principle of intentional design, such as knowing why and who. We will also learn how to measure and improve design outcomes and navigate common challenges in the design process. Whether you are a designer looking for enhance your design approach or stakeholders wanting to understand how design decisions impact user experiences, or anyone interested in creating a user-friendly and effective design, this session will provide a valuable insight for all of you. Our next speaker is Jocelyn Hendrickson. She is a senior product manager at WordPress Commerce at Bluehost and have 10 years of hosting experience in the experience in industry, hosting industry. She has curious problem solving mindset and has strong belief that there is no limit what can be built when, the com when we combine the creativity with curiosity. Jocelyn has led numerous transformative projects, including successful third-party integrations, interface designs, and system improvement projects. And she also had a very interesting WordCamp journey. The, her wor first, wor first ever WordCamp was WordCamp Asia that happened last year. And the second WordCamp was WordCamp Europe that happened last year. And the third WordCamp was WordCamp US. So she started her work camp journey with the, all the big work camps. And she's a mother of five kids, also has two cats and one dog. Anyone cat lover here? <laughs> and today she is accompanied by her mother, who is here to cheer her. Please raise your hand and say hi to all our audience. So please welcome Jocelyn and learn about intentional design and crafting a purposeful digital experience. Please welcome. Hasn't this been an amazing WordCamp so far? Are you guys loving it? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Uh, like he said, I'm Jocelyn Hendrickson. I'm a senior product manager at Bluehost. I've been there for 11 years. A little bit more about me, He's, you know, he mentioned I have five kids, two cats and a dog. Yeah, it's a little bit busy there. I'm an artist, I'm a creator. I love building new things, I love designing new things, whether it's with digital art or watercolor or anything else. I just love the process of creation. As a product manager, oftentimes, the projects I work on have a lot of overlap with developers marketers, designers, um, and it's a really interesting and a unique place that I'm in because my job is to create and come up with innovative solutions or build on existing solutions that are in the market and seeing how we can improve those. And I think one of the best ways to do that is with intention, 
with purpose. And so that's really what we're going to be talking about today is how the process in which you design things really can lead to either a really great experience or kind of be a flop. So the lead up question was really great because we've all been here before, right? Where we've used an app or a website that is so frustrating for whatever reason. It might be slow, it might um, have too much clutter in it, it has a confusing navigation, and it's terrible. You don't want to return to that site ever again or use that app again. It leaves you, disapp leaves you really disappointed as compared to an experience that's really delightful. There's a few applications that I use and websites that I go to that every time I go to them, it's because they make me feel great. I love using them. I'm able to accomplish the task that I set out to accomplish. The difference between these two experiences is really the intention behind how they were created, how they were crafted, and the way that that website and that solution communicates with you and resonates with you. So what is intentional design? It's a process where the user's intentions with the product, app, or website are considered at each point of the design process. It begins with the conception, it begins with the documentation, it begins with the thoughts and the ideas that you communicate with others. Um, it, it even goes down to as simple as like, should I use a comma or a semicolon here? It's the details that matter when you're designing with intention. So everything has always a specific purpose when you're designing with intention. Whether it's you're solving a problem, whether you're trying to communicate information or reinforce a message to your audience. Everything is chosen deliberately. So I will start this off by telling a story. Well, let me back up a little bit. We'll talk about why it matters. When you design with intention, you're able to build user-friendly, accessible experiences that speak and resonate with your audience. By understanding your users' needs, their preferences, their pain points, their motivations, you design solutions that really meet their exp expectations and provide value. So with that, I'm gonna now tell a story. So a few years ago, I had this dream of completely redesigning my office area. And I spent a lot of time on Amazon adding things to my wish list. I spent a lot of time on Pinterest pinning different things. And it was this complete dream to have a space where I could go create, do art, and be really, uh, like just have a space that was mine that felt like me. Because prior to that, I really didn't. I just kind of had things thrown in there and cluttered. And my husband was very patient with me. He told me, you can buy anything that you want. We can design it however you want. It's your space. So I ordered some incredible wallpaper and a light fixture that matched. And I was super excited for this journey and for redesigning this office. So we took everything out put up the wallpaper, my husband installed the light fixture, and I was so excited. I was seeing my dream come true of this space that I wanted to create. And then I started buying a lot of packages from Amazon and buying things from the store, like a lot of things that probably shouldn't need to do. <laughs> they didn't maybe match. Um, I was just very excited and my excitement got the best of me. And after we put up the wallpaper and the light fixture, I still had to work on Monday, so I reluctantly returned my craft desk, my work desk, set everything back up, but still was very excited. And all those boxes that I purchased from Amazon that were showing up at my doorstep and things from the store, uh, yeah, that's when, that's when kind of things went, things went wrong. <laughs> this is kind of what my office area started to look like. All the packages stacked up against each other. I had paintings and pictures that were mismatched. It was complete chaos. But I'll tell you that I knew where everything, where everything was in the chaos. But if I asked my husband, hey, can you go get me some scissors from my area? He would never be able to find them. But I understood the chaos. And he asked me one time, he's like, this is really how you want your area where you're supposed to be calm and productive to be? No, it was not how I wanted it to be at all. But I'd lost sight of my original intentions of wanting to redesign my office. And I brought things in. and purchase things just because I could. And that really leads to the point that I think is really important with this is that intentionality beats impulsivity. 
it's really easy to make quick decisions and get that instant gratification because you're able to do it. We live in a fast-paced world where decisions are made really fast, but we lose sight of that intention and we end up oftentimes, some websites kind of feel like this, I think, sometimes too. So how do you become intentional? I'll walk through um, some principles of intentional designing today. Uh, so we start with kind of knowing your purpose, your audience, and then talk about simplicity, connection, clarity, and impact. So the first thing is before you start designing anything, and this can be for anybody, and when I'm talking about designing, I wanna make it very clear. I am not a designer. I do not go on to Photoshop and design things. Designing things can extend way beyond that, whether it's your designing an API, if you're developers, you want to design APIs that everybody wants to integrate with. If you are designing a marketing campaign, if you're designing products, if you are actually a designer, this can extend to anything. And that's kind of why I started with the story of my office redesign is because these principles, I really hope that you're able to take them and apply them to whatever it is that you want to create. And in order to do that, you have to start with your purpose. You have to have a clear vision of what you want to achieve. And oftentimes what you'll see is we'll have this large purpose of our website, and that's great. We use that as our North Star, and we continue to, to think about that. But then when we're building small details, such as maybe a contact form, the purpose is maybe for a newsletter, right? Like sign up for my newsletter. All you really need is an email address, and maybe I agree to receive emails. But sometimes you'll see those and it will be like first name, last name, favorite color, what's your pet's name, you know, what did you eat last night for dinner, and there's no point of that, right? So you'll need to ask yourself what the problem is you're trying to solve, what's the value that you're trying to provide, and what's the impact that you are trying to make. And that's not just for the entire solution, that's for every component in your solution. And in order to do that, you have to know your who. Who are you building this for? Who are you designing for? Why do they need this? What pain points are you trying to solve for them? What are their goals? What are their motivations? Why is it that this is a product or a solution that they need? Oftentimes, uh, you'll hear about understanding your users and we'll hear the same types of Practices, I guess, is the best way to say it. So doing things like create a user persona. Let's do market research. Let's have customer analytics to understand our person. But for me, I think that's a great starting point. And I think it's important to do these things, but people don't want to be personas. People want to be seen as a human. They want to feel that when they're using your product or your you know, website, app, whatever it is, that they are seen, that they are heard. Um, so, we've got to paint the rest of the picture. And we do that through the first thing that we'll talk about is empathy. It's our way to see the world through other people's eyes. It's our way to see what they see, feel what they feel, and experience things as they do. It really is the cornerstone of intentional design because it helps us understand the problems and the realities of the people that we're designing for. So seeing through the world through their eyes is something that is so powerful and it's something that I don't think oftentimes we take a step back to do. You'll hear about method acting um, and I think it's important for us to do method designing or method browsing even, if you've heard that term, where you become that person, you become that user and you see the world through their eyes. So, you know, imagine you're designing an app or a website for somebody who's taking care of elderly parents that have fallen sick. They don't want to have a lot of data points saying like, here's the features and the benefits and it's only $9,000 a month. They want to see that you care about the problems. Like think about the worry, the sleepless nights, that am I going to remember to give the medication on time or I have to go out of town, who's going to take care of it? They want to feel seen and heard and that your solution really delivers to them. Now that being said, people are not robots. P.S. This was all generated by AI and AI is not very great at spelling, so just ignore the words. But emotional state matters to users. So like I said, 
in that instance where I'm feeling really nervous and I'm having all this worry with this with this situation I'm in about taking care of elderly parents, mom, you're not elderly. I don't think that at all, by the way. It's just an example. <laughs> um, but I, that's how I feel. But maybe I'm telling my best friend and I say, hey, Laura, I'm really looking for this solution. I, I don't know what to do. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling anxious. She might want those bullet points of those features because she's not feeling the way that I feel. And so it's important that we're not always emotional, but we're not always analytical because we're humans. And sometimes we are, we work in an emotional state and an analytical state. And so it's important to recognize the difference between the two and to test and see how your audience responds to the way that you're communicating with them. The next part is to design for context. Do you know where your users are using your solution? Do you know how they're using it? Understanding the context of how they use it and when and why they need to use it is just as important as knowing their needs and their wants and their preferences. Um, so, I mean, for example, designing an application that's used in a cozy little quiet cafe gives you more affordances than you get where if you're designing an application that people are going to be used in a really busy train stop, right? They're trying, they're running late for work, they need to catch that next bus. They don't wanna have to take the time to figure out and go through the maze of your solution. They want that information where they need that information. And that's why the next part is accessibility as part of empathy. This is a measurement of the user's ability to use the products and services to the extent and ease that they can use them. It can be temporal disabilities, temporary disabilities they may have or permanent ones. Um, accessibility design is inclusive of everybody and it is not an afterthought. And I wanna make that very clear because oftentimes it is in a lot of products. But if you think about those users with visual impairments, motor disabilities, cognitive challenges, how can we make our products inclusive of them? Those alt text for images, keyboard navigation, color contrast, those are not check boxes. They are expressions of empathy. And they say, we see you and we care. This quote really just reminds me a lot of the importance of empathy and understanding. So if we want our users to connect and find value in the products that we're delivering, we must first really understand and recognize with their needs. We need to design products that not only solve their problems, but they resonate with them on a deeper level. Um, and I, I mentioned it a bit before, but the tacit knowledge, uh, having an experience that you would never be able to understand unless you've lived through it is really, really important. So if you wish for me to weep, you, mu you yourself must first feel grief. How can you design a solution for somebody whose problem you don't understand? I, I don't think it's possible. Which brings us to connection. It's great to have empathy. It's great to understand those things. It's great to understand your people, but without connection, it also doesn't matter. We need to use storytelling and emotion to create that connection with the user. We need to provide interactivity and feedback to make them feel involved and empowered in your solution. We need to reward them for their small achievements, like yay, they did the thing you wanted them to do. It's very, very important for the users that they feel that connection. And I've heard it actually in a couple times in this WordCamp where people have talked about examples and they said, I actually loved that website because it spoke to me. It's important to speak the language that your users are using, and I'm not talking about English, Spanish, Chinese, like that. It's, it's the language that they use and that they understand. Which brings us to simplicity. Uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci put it this way, is that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Another example of complete chaos. Can anybody find the, the pinwheel in here? It's like blue. Anybody? I couldn't find it either, but it's supposed to be there. But this is oftentimes how users feel is this complete chaos on their website when the website isn't simplistic. 
Now, how about we find a colored pencil? It's very clear where that is. To have a very intentional design, we need to make sure that we are removing the clutter that we have on the website. Just like you don't want to live in a home that's cluttered with garbage or laundry not put away. I know sometimes we're all there, but it doesn't feel great. We need to remove the unnecessary, remove the clutter, focus on the essentials. I mentioned that at the beginning, but what is its purpose? Why is it there? And if you don't know that answer, it shouldn't be there. It needs to be removed. It shouldn't exist just because it can, kind of like my office, just because I could buy a lot of things didn't mean I should actually bring them in. The unnecessary distractions that we have on our website confuse and frustrate users. When we remove them, your website and your solution becomes more pleasant, more appealing, and interactive. Clarity goes hand in hand with simplicity. It's really difficult to have clarity, in my opinion. It's really easy to be unclear. For clarity, it's important that we think about our copy and our content. What are the words that we're using? Are we using jargon? Are we using insider uh, conversations with our users? Or again, are we speaking their language? Are we using good fonts? Is our font size big enough? Can you read the fonts, a, a dark font on a dark background? No, right? You need to make sure that everything that you have is clear, that people can not only read it, but understand it. Your structure and navigation, the way that you inform your users where they are in your application is very important too. You know, you kind of go down a rabbit hole of website navigation and now you don't know how to go back. And that's where adding the details like the breadcrumbs and a clear and strong navigation are really, really important. One of my favorite quotes by Brene Brown is, uh, clear is, oh, this is like opposite. It's throwing me off. Okay. Clear is kind and unclear is unkind. We shouldn't make our users guess what we mean. We should tell them exactly what we mean every single time. And it's funny, when um, Contributor Day, this quote got brought up by somebody else, and I'm like, it's going to be in my talk. And it was really exciting because I think it's really powerful. We also need to understand the impact of our designs and our design choices which means that we're measuring our outcomes and the results of our solutions. So start by setting very clear goals that can be tracked. You need to use the data and analytics that are behind them to evaluate the performance and the effectiveness of your solution, even down to the smallest details such as a button or a link. Evaluate the user feedback and satisfaction that you're getting from your customers to understand not just like the visual experience, but their perception of it. How did they feel? How did they, how do they tell others about it? Are they going to leave your application or your website feeling unsure about it or, man, that was terrible, never go there. But you need to understand the story behind that. And from there, you, you take this information to move to the next phase, which we'll talk about is iterating. It's not just enough though to understand the analytics. In order to be empathetic and to really design intentionally, you need to build the bridges between the data that you're seeing and the analytics that you're seeing and the stories behind them, right? So somebody abandoned the shopping cart, but why did they abandon the shopping cart? What, what was the reason that they did or did not feel that way? What is their background or the characteristics that made them feel the same way? People are not the same. We could go to the same website and I might love it and you might hate it and that's okay. And that's why you need to tie the data to the, to the humans behind the data. And iterate. Iterate often. Test often. We have good ideas and it's, it can be really difficult, I think, to iterate because you're like, no, this was a great idea. I don't want to change anything. You should. You should test. You should iterate. You should take those analytics and the feedback that you're getting, prioritize changes and ideas that you might want to, that you might want to make on your solution, and make them small, one change at a time. If you change an entire web page because the analytics are saying that it's not converting or you're not getting a lot of views, and you change the whole thing, 
you're not going to know if it was it the messaging you were using, was it the button, the hero image? Make small changes and make them frequently to understand how you can improve your solution. I will say designing with intention is not easy. It's difficult and it can be time consuming and it's something that needs to have a lot of practice. It's really easy to have a, an idea and put it out there without any more thought to it. Some of the common challenges that you see, we'll kind of talk about, is lack of awareness. Really not understanding the full concept of what you're trying to build and why. And I, I've done this a lot with um, my UX team is I'll say, hey, we're trying to build X feature and they go, okay, and they bring something to me and it's lack of awareness because I have the context behind it and they may not have all the context behind it. There may not be enough time. Time constraints are a real thing. You might have a lot of pressure from your business or from your clients. And so fitting those tight deadlines is easy and it leads to really haphazard designs that are rushed and they feel rushed. Sometimes we focus too much on the aesthetics and making it look pretty over the functionality. The functionality is really, really important. Client demands, like I talked about, they have a lot of demands and sometimes they don't want to listen to your suggestions. They don't want to, they don't want to hear you say, no, that's not going to work. They just want what they want. Uh, we may have limited resources, again, time, money, et cetera. Lack of user research or empathy in building those solutions makes it difficult. Again, if you don't know who you're building for, what their pain points are, how can you build a solution for them? Resistance to change. I've been there before where I've built a solution, I've built uh, you know, different things for Bluehost, and it doesn't perform out, and I'm like, no, it's gonna work, and I don't wanna change it because it's a great idea. It should be changed. It's not, it's not bad to be wrong. What's bad is that we are resistant to changing our ideas and doing something else. And then misalignment of goals. This goes back a lot to the clarity point, is making sure that things are understood before you start designing. Making sure you're in alignment with the people that you're working with. You know, designers between designers or developers or stakeholders, you may have difference of opinion and different priorities or goals so the designs lead to lack of intentionality. My favorite one to talk about though is the curse of knowledge. Having knowledge is great. I love learning things, but it's also kind of a curse. Because when we have this curse of knowledge, it's really easy to assume user familiarity. Just because I know something does not mean that you know something. Right? I, I, we, we're not on the same wavelength. Everybody has a different level of understanding things. We'll use insider language because in our jobs and in our day to day, we are used to speaking that way to each other. But your users may not be used to understanding that language. And I don't think that we oftentimes see that we are speaking that way or that we are that way to them. We're overlooking user needs. We think that we know what they need more than they know what they need. Right? Because we know, we have the information, we have the context. But we don't use that oftentimes in a full story. And one of the biggest ones I think is underestimating learning curves. Using a new app, using a new website, it can be difficult, it can prove challenging. We need to make sure that we're understanding and we know that it takes time to onboard to a new, new solution and that we're patient with those new users. So, design with intention, design with purpose. Intentional design is impactful, it's inspirational, and it's important. That's everything I have today. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, that was an interesting session. Thanks a lot for this. So, we have time for QA. Anybody of have any questions? We have some. Turn over here. Nagesh, can you go there? Yep. Hello. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, it was a great sum up of a lot of topics, very well connected. Uh, I have a question regarding um, where you talk about uh, the resistance to change. 
and you said that uh, you want to that your team have designed something and you are like yeah it's going to work I was wondering when is the time that you start to iterate and you decide that okay this didn't work because if you have the resistance to change you I, I really don't know when is the exact time that uh, you lose the hope or 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 you take the metrics and say like okay th this really don't work we need to start with uh, uh, we need to change it and start again. Okay, so the, the question, and I, I think I'm understanding it right, is that you're asking when is the best time to look at our existing solution and decide based on the analytics when we need to iterate and, and how do we do that? Is that basically what you're asking? Okay. Yeah. That's a great question and I think that it goes back to a couple of points is you have to start with knowing your purpose and setting very clear goals. If your goal is to build a web page that's going to have, say, like 50% conversion or whatever it is, and you're not hitting that goal, that's a clear indication that it's time to look into it. And it's really important to make sure that you have the analytics on your website that you're looking at, and you're looking at them regularly, and you're evaluating what you're seeing against those goals. Mm -hmm. um, and so as far as like knowing when to iterate, I think as long as you kind of go through the steps and you say, okay, do I understand what I'm building? Does it, does the solution there, is it the right thing? Mm -hmm. It might be the wrong color or the wrong words. Mm -hmm. But I think building with users and doing user testing will also help that. Mm -hmm. So I, the best time is when you're not achieving your goals and your outcomes, it's time to reevaluate because if, if you're not achieving them, you're, you're failing. And we, we don't wanna fail. We wanna, we wanna have successful websites or products. Mm -hmm. So that would be my advice is take a look at what you're trying to achieve, see how far off you are. And if you're like trending up and you're like not there yet, but it's a good trajectory, like maybe don't change it for a while. Give it the time, you know, to ramp. But if it's not, if you're not seeing kind of that return on investment, then I would say to figure out where it's going wrong. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. Any other questions we have? So um, <clears throat> that the situation we found, we got the situation lately with the clients, one of our clients. So we are developing the um, the consent page for them to read, for the user to read um, the privacy notice and including a term of term of service. And we consult with the the, the clients um, lawyer, lawyer teams, mm -hmm. and we uh, come up with a design that we we think that is this. For us, I, we think that it is good for the customer experience entirely. Mm -hmm. But when we present it to the lawyer, they 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 resist us. Then they say that no, you need to put um, the terms and condition before you sign up process. But instead, we are designing the the term and condition built in into the sign up form. Mm -hmm. How can we um, persuade? the lawyers or the, the another stakeholders to make sure that um, what we are designing, what we, our intention to let people um, do the sign up in the sign up process to make sure that we are on the same page and they understand what our intention is. Okay, that's a great question. So the, the question was with the resistance to change yep. and they had a project where they were working on building out a website and they were building out um, the content and they have the terms and service page and the lawyers said that, or they did not want to have the terms and conditions as something that they had to agree upon when signing up for the form. Uh, after after we, we filled in everything and then we read the term and condition. Sure. Um, and it just seems as though their design and the lawyers were not on the same page and that they insisted yep. on it being way. Okay, so my advice is to, um, working with the legal teams is difficult. Laws exist exactly. for a reason. Exactly. I probably would like just let that one go to be, because I'm not, not a lawyer. Um, that is a very difficult one. And I've run into that a lot where even I was talking about language using clear and concise language when it comes to lawyers and like legally speak, you, you, there are things you have to, it's a lot, right? That's why we yep. have legal teams is to protect companies. Yep. Um, and so I think for other situations, uh, with legal that's tricky. But 
how you persuade them that your idea is better, the best way to do that is to A-B test, mm -hmm. right? Like listen to your stakeholders. Your stakeholders' feedback is important. And I think it's important to collaborate and say, can we try it this way for X amount of time? Or maybe we do split traffic testing this way and that way. And let's see what the results are. Uh huh. That's a great idea. Thank you. Yep. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm a user researcher. And um, I very much agree on your point of view about like how to build the empathies to, with um, um, with your teams, right, and helping the teams understanding users. But um, in your last point about a new user that need, uh, new solutions that require times and also need to be patient. Uh, as a user researcher, I can also very much like I wanted to in my current situation. I really wanted to persuade my team to be patient because I know like how much the learning curve we're introducing. Uh, to the users, right? Um, but what if there's no time and there's, you also know there's a cost of waiting, right? And this is actually putting the whole company into the risk. Um, as a, a product manager, how are you going to balance your times and also the cost of patience? Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I think that those are really great questions. It, Sometimes we have to build things and we have to build them quickly. And it's okay to build quickly and it's okay to fail fast. I think that it's important to always be performing user research regardless of it is. And even if it's deployed after, like if, if you deploy a new solution and you're doing that user research afterwards, then you can take that information to propose iterations to make changes for the future. Because I know sometimes with stakeholders and alignment, it just, there there is no time you know, for those things. and. I think it's really important why I talked about the common challenges is because it is hard. It is hard because there is that time constraint. There is that pressure. There is that misalignment of stakeholders to those people. Um, so I think it's really a process and it's something that you have to push forward. And, and once you can kind of explain the benefits and get alignment with your team on those things, I think it will come to fruition. But I, I don't know. I, I mean, obviously I don't work for your company, but sometimes you can't you can't change those time time frames and I would say to just keep pushing keep doing the research even if it's deployed understand it and then you can use it as a post launch understanding of, of what it is hi Aaron hi um, I loved the part where you were talking about kind of building the bridge between data and stories um, and I think that often as we're building stuff on the web, we're good at collecting data and we can be a, it can be a struggle to collect those stories. And so we tend to infer those stories. We assume based on the data of someone leaving the cart that we maybe know why. Do you have any like tips or tricks on how to best collect the stories in order to connect them to the data? Ask them. Talk to them. Reach out to your customers. Um, I think it's really important that you have a connection with your customers always. If you're not talking directly to the people who are using your products, whether that's through contacting them via email or text, et cetera, to say, can we ask you more stories? Like, can we ask you these questions? Let them tell you the information. Asking for feedback, you know, having like overall how satisfied with this today, or even, hey, like you didn't purchase this item, sending an email, is everything good? You know, you ask them talk to them. You should always be talking and connecting with your users. I love it. Thanks, Aaron. Can you talk a little bit about how we can scale that? Because that could definitely take a lot of time having all those conversations. It, it does. So when I say talk to your users, I don't mean like like some of you, you know, we work for, we have millions of customers in, in some of our places and it, it does take a lot of time. But I think it's important for you to first understand what you're trying to like the answers you're trying to get. And I think that if you create cohorts of different user segments and understand, okay, these users are a pro user or they're a novice user, right? And you kind of have to make some inferences on the data that you're seeing to say, okay, this is the target audience that I should be talking to about this very specific thing. Um, it does take time, but 
you know, luckily there's a lot of tools that we have that we can say now analyze this and tell me the output, right? Like you give me this information. So it, it can be hard to scale, but as long as you're always doing it, as long as you're reaching out and you have, I think, a consistent program in place to collect that is good. Um, working with others, I we try to talk to users at least once a month, you know, reach out and just say, hey, do you have quick 30 minutes? Can we talk to you through, can we talk through some of these things? Um, I think it's just hard to answer that, like as a blanket statement, just know your goal, figure out what you're trying to understand, and find the humans that have the story behind that to talk to. And often with companies, it requires a full UX research team. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, Carl. Hi. Hi. Uh, if you're a noob at intentional design like myself, what would be like good resources? How did you learn about intentional design? Like, where would you point somebody? There's a lot of really great books that are out there. Um, there's a lot of really great articles. Actually, there was um, at one of the Apple conventions they had, somebody had a, com uh, a talk about kind of designing with purpose. But the way that I learned about it is, I, my background is I started at Bluehost in customer service. So I was talking to the customers regularly, but usually it was with problems. And I became very in, interested in the reason that they were calling us because they couldn't do something or they may have been frustrated. And over time, I kind of started becoming friends with the developer so I could say, hey, can we change this? Like, even though it had nothing to do with me, I just was answering calls. Um, but the user experience became something that I just cared very deeply about myself. And so over my career, I've, I've spent a lot of time figuring out how the type of product manager I want to be and the type of uh, the way that I want to innovate with other people. Um, but I will, when we have the links on the slides, I think I have a slide on here that has a list of resources of books that I think are really important um, that can be helpful. So you can refer Sweet. to those. Thanks. And you can always ask me, you can reach out to me. <laughs> She's on the Twitter. I'm and on everything. the Twitter. I did a thing. I'm at the Blue House booth most of the time. Exactly. So reach out. You know, I'm happy. You know where to find her. Yeah, I, I'm happy to answer any questions and mentor anybody that wants more information. And she's doing all the work camps now. That's how you were introduced to. <laughs> yes, that is how we became friends. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. So I think this will be the last question because we are running out of time. I have a question about hiring. So I was once told a product designer shouldn't be looking into data. Um, so I'm wondering if you build your own team, what is the most important element um, when you're hiring a, a designer or like a build a product design team that can conduct this kind of research, especially if you're in a startup? That's a great question and not something I have experience in. I'm not, I don't hire people. I'm not on the, I'm, I'm not a designer, but I think. Who you enjoy working with if you have some buddies that work with you? What abilities that we would look into? Sure, I am somebody who is able to really analyze information that they're very excited about learning about customers, that they're not afraid to talk to customers. Um, people who like to be innovative, they love to challenge, they have new ideas. Um, and people that just really showcase that they understand the reasons behind what they're doing. Um, Oh, that's a hard I work with so many different people and everybody has very different skill sets. But um, yeah, I think just somebody who constantly wants to improve and make things better for the right reasons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jocelyn, for sharing all the wisdom and knowledge with us and answering all these questions. If you have any other questions around, then you can join meet her outside this hall. So that's all for the today. And we have a special token of appreciation for our speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.